morning. This morning's scripture will be taken from Luke chapter 6, verses 43 through 45. For no good tree bears bad fruit, nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit. For each tree is known by its own fruit. For figs are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor are grapes picked from a bramble bush. The good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good and the evil person out of his evil treasure produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. Well, good morning, Mesa Church of Christ. My name is Greg Anderson, and I'm really honored to be here. I'm in Phoenix. I believe that is Greek for convection oven. Is that right? Is that that what Phoenix means? It's a little toasty, but that's all right. We're all good. Hey, I met with your elders on Friday night for dinner and just for a get-to-know-one-another session, and I met with your search team yesterday for our first meeting and uh, for lunch, and then I was at the Campbell's last night for dinner, and I'm going to lunch with Terry today. So when Doug talked last week about that 10-pound thing, you know, uh, I'm pretty sure that's a, You guys love to eat, right? Man, this is an eating church, so that's a good thing. I'm excited about being able to, to share that with you. Doug also mentioned last week that you are in transition. So uh, if you didn't get the memo uh, to why I'm here, let me share a little bit of information with you on that. Uh, I'm I'm just here to come alongside you. I'm here to just spend some time with you over the next several weeks and uh, months. God gets to decide how long. I'm here to provide a listening ear. It's one of the main reasons that I'm with you. Uh, I'm here to provide some coaching when and where it's appropriate to spend some time working with the uh, search team and to be in the word with you as we strive um, to reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 13. Um, You are in the middle of what we refer to today and next Sunday, I'm going to call it, you're in, the, uh, you're in the and. You may have thought it was a misprint in the bulletin. You may have thought the word was supposed to be end, but you're not at the end. You're in the and. So hang with me with that uh, phrase. You are in um, an in-between time, okay? So uh, you're in that, in that phase where you're between Terry's ministry and, and here we go, the uh, ministry of the next preaching minister that God's going to send your way. And, and my job is to help in this season of and uh, being in the word with you, as I said, and praying and processing with the elders. And what a search team. You're going to have a chance, I think, to meet all of them collectively either next Sunday or a, an upcoming Sunday soon. Um, I'm not here as a candidate, okay? Uh, I'm not here to impose my opinions on you or your uh, leaders. For the next several months, we're just going to walk together, pray together, serve together, and uh, give God the glory for what happens during this time of transition. Amen? Yeah. Uh, In this time of living in the end. Uh, Doug mentioned last week, I actually watched it, and he said something about me walking on water. Um, I I only know two people who walked on water, and we all remember how that worked out for Peter, right? Um, I I barely can walk on land, okay? So just so you know, um, I am fallible. I can go ahead and clarify the expectation right now that I will make some mistakes, Okay, I will probably do some things you won't like and say some things you won't like. And that's okay. You'll probably do some things and say some things that I don't like. But we're all in this together. We're all in this together. Um, I, I want to just praise God with you this morning that we have a Savior who has lavished upon us his glorious 
grace that he's freely given us in the one that he loves, Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 6. So if we can all live into that together, we're going to have a wonderful, wonderful time over these next many weeks. Uh, I'm probably going to be with you about three Sundays a month, and I'm going to attempt to book my flights so that we've got time to uh, visit, should you wish to do so. I love coffee. I'm a coffee guy. And I love coffee more when somebody else buys it. So (laughs) if you ever want to take me to a coffee, that would be great. We'll sit down and schedule the time. Just reach out to any of your elders and say, hey, I'd like to get to know that guy from Texas a little bit better. And we'll sit down and visit and uh, just share sweet communion together. Uh, So if you want, just let the elders know, and they'll be happy to set that up. So a few weeks ago, I wrapped up my time as lead minister at the A&M Church of Christ in College Station, Texas, uh, and I began my new position as co-leader of Hope Network Ministries. The A&M Church of Christ is still going to be our home church, um, but with their blessing, I am now engaging in greater kingdom ministry. And ironically, that means that the A&M Church of Christ is also looking for its next minister, (laughs) next preaching minister. So I'm gonna ask that you pray for my home church uh, uh, as as we all walk together uh, kind of at the same place at the same time. So during one of my last Sundays there, I I preached on Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23, to prepare our church for the interim season. And I couldn't think of a more fitting text for launching your interim season today. And so we're going to spend most of our time today talking about the greater context uh, surrounding Galatians 5, and then we're going to focus more on specific application next Sunday. So this morning... Let's just uh, set the stage by reading together Galatians 5, 22 through 23. The Apostle Paul writes the following. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires. And since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. So I think if we're really going to understand this text... We need to see how Galatians 5 is situated in the greater story of God. So a question this morning is, where do we begin? And I find usually one of the best places to begin is at the beginning. So I want to ask you to explore with me a few verses this morning from Genesis chapters 2 and, and, uh, and 3. Now, the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, Genesis 2, 8. And there he he put the man he had formed. And the Lord God made all kinds of trees to grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and were good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The Lord God took the man and he put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you'll surely die. So I want to pause there for just a second draw a little bit of attention to some key words and phrases in that, in those verses. So God places man in the garden. There's two primary reasons. First, to work the garden. And second, to take care of it. So as a result, man can be nourished by the fruit that's in the garden, especially the fruit of the tree of life. 
which has nothing to do with man's labor, but it has everything to do with God's eternal nature. Now, we don't know a lot about the tree of life. Um, we know it's very powerful, very powerful source of, of, of strength and healing and renewal. We notice these words from Genesis chapter 3 and verse 22 that describes the power of this particular tree. And the Lord God said, the man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So that's a pretty powerful tree, right? We also know that this tree is present in the beginning as we just read in Genesis 3, and then it will also be present at the end um, and, and, and beyond. And its healing powers are eternal. I want you to notice the following text from Revelation 22. And then the angel, John says, showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and from the Lamb, and down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. And I love this promise. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. So there's just so much that has and is happening between the tree of life in the garden and the tree of life in the new Jerusalem. And I refer to this time between the trees, just my own personal phrase, I call it the great and, the great and, between the opening pages of Scripture and the closing pages of Scripture. It's, it's a time frame that's comprised of billions, with a B, it's comprised of, of billions of little ands in the greater context of Humanity, And you know what I mean by that, right? We all are walking ands <laughs> between birth and, and, and our toddler years and our toddler years and our preschool years. And we can go on and on and on and on. Life is just a series of ands in the greater and. So I came across a book a few months back uh, by Shane uh, Wood. And the title of this book is Between Two Trees. And I thought, what a fascinating, what a fascinating title. And he makes an interesting observation about what happens in the great and between these two trees. And this is what he writes. And so the Bible ends where it begins, in a garden paradise. God with humanity enjoying the shade of the tree of life. The problem is... Life isn't lived under Eden's tree of life or beneath the healing leaves of the tree in the New Jerusalem. Life is lived between these two trees, and between these two trees, life is hard. Can I get a, oh yeah? Life's hard. Life between the trees, life in the great and, it, it, stretches us, sometimes to the point that we almost feel like we're going to break. Life presses us down, sometimes almost to the point of, of crushing. Life sometimes causes us to cry out, God, where are you? Lord, have you, have you forgotten me? Is anybody there? Lord, are you listening? In the great end, between the two trees, life is hard. However, however, if you and I can make a subtle shift in our understanding of, of life between the two trees, the, the tree of life in the original garden of God and the tree of life in the future city of God, 
If we can make this subtle shift of, of our understanding, then instead of being consumed by the hardness of life, we become a people who are empowered by the holiness of God. And that reframes our entire purpose of why we're here and also empowers us to, to truly be people of, of good news. So I want to dig just a little bit deeper this morning into this tree of life. I want to sit for just a few moments underneath its canopy, and I just want to marvel for a little bit at what we find there. Let's taste the fruit and see that it is good, and let's share it with others as we partner with God to restore his creation, a creation that was disrupted, by the way, by a serpent who's very good at biding his time and waiting for the right moment to strike. Genesis 3.1. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, well, we can eat from any tree in the garden. But God did say you must not eat from the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you'll surely die. <laughs> you, you will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food, and it was pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some. And she ate it. She also gave to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. And then the eyes of both of them were open. Now, my hunch is we have read this passage so many times, it's easy for us to read it and not be moved by it. And yet, yet, this episode reveals the devastating impact of what happened when humankind broke covenant with God. Shane Wood, I want to return to something he wrote, describes it this way, and I think this is some pretty brilliant insight. He says, when Adam and Eve ate of the fruit, they were not merely disobeying a command, although indeed they were. They were not just committing an indiscretion, although indeed they did. The action was more dire, the result more severe. For sin is willful union with something or someone other than God. The problem of Genesis 3 wasn't only an infraction of the law. It was far worse. Humanity became one flesh with death. Now, the, the contrast is pretty evident when we compare God's intentions with humanity's disobedience. And I just want you to notice two passages side by side here. The first is from Genesis chapter 2, 24 and 25, when God gives woman to man. Adam said, this is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for God took her out of man. And this is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. But notice what happens after the fall, Genesis 3, 6, and 7. When the woman saw the fruit of the tree was good and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took it and she ate it. And she gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. And then the eyes of both of them were open. I want you to see a few highlighted words here as you look at these contrasts. Do you see that they were united? Do you see that they were one? But after they ate the fruit, what happens? eyes are open. Not only do they see God differently, but they see each other differently. Not only do they see each other differently, but they see the world around them differently. All of a sudden, everything has changed. Because if you boil it down to its essence, to what were their eyes opened? Well, their eyes were open to something other than 
what God intended. And the results were instantaneous. Just notice, for the first time, they experience shame. Genesis 3, 7. They shift the blame. Genesis uh, 3, 12, and 13. As a matter of fact, Adam actually blames God. That woman you gave me, right? He goes so far as to blame God. And nothing is the same. From Genesis 3 all the way up to right now in 2021. But you see, from this moment in time, humankind partnered with death. And I could, I could preach on this for like a year and still barely scratch the surface, I think, of all that's happening right here. But here's what I want to ask you to grasp this morning, just this one truth with me. As we think about this, this and that you are in as a congregation, but that and being set within the greater and between the two trees, I want to ask you to grasp this one truth with me, and this is, this is it. The world God intended is not the world we live in. But the world we live in provides opportunity to restore the world God intended. Church, are you with me? You see, you see what opportunity is before us as we are the hands and feet of Jesus? And we're not going to get it right every time. Uh, Michael Heiser, in a book entitled The Unseen Realm, writes, All humans are divine imagers. We're made in the image of God, right? All humans are divine imagers, but in our fallen condition, we don't often image God as we are able and as he intended. So here's a question I want to process with you this morning. How do we do that? How do we help restore the world that God intended? I believe the answer is twofold. I believe we work the garden of God, and I believe we take care of the garden of God. And of course, I'm talking somewhat literally in our various realms of influence, but I'm also talking figuratively, spiritually, as we think about being in places where God has put us. What are we going to do when we're in those spaces? My hope is we're going to work where God's put us, and we're going to take care of where God has put us. Put us. As I said a few moments ago, this interim season, it's one little and within the greater and, and it provides phenomenal opportunity for us to work the garden of God and take care of the garden of God here at the Mesa Church of Christ. So let's explore a little bit more and we'll wrap up. Do you remember what the trees in the garden produced? Do you remember what did the trees in the garden produce? It's okay to talk in church. What, what did they say? What did they produce? Fruit, yeah, fruit. Here it is, Genesis 2, 9. The Lord God made all kinds of trees to grow out of the ground, and they were pleasing to the eye, and they were also good for food. God made trees that were beautiful. That's a reflection of God's nature, of his glory. But he also made trees that produced fruit, and, and fruit that wasn't just edible, but fruit that is good to eat, food that is life-giving. Food that is fully from God, but are on trees that man is expected to tend. And man is intended to, was intended to harvest. Work was not a result of the fall. Work was not a result of the curse. Man was placed in the garden to work the garden before the fall. Are you with me? So remember, humankind was, was, was placed there to, to work it and to take care of it. That's God's intention. And as far as I can tell, there's nothing in Scripture that indicates that God's intention changed. Man was cursed, of course, because of his choices, but that curse was reversed through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, praise God. But man's curse didn't change God's intention. And I think if we could sum it up in a nutshell, it would go something like this, and that is church, individual Christian, work to take care of what God has given you. Work to take care of what God's given you. 
And you may be thinking, well, that just sounds kind of like an Old Testament thing to me. And I'm not so sure that that applies to us today. Well, you might want to rethink that. <laughs> okay? I want you to notice this passage from Ephesians chapter 4. Paul writes, beginning at verse 10, So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, the teachers, to equip his people for, say it with me, works of service. Why? Why? So that the body of Christ can be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God, becoming mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Look at these words and think about God's original intentions, equipped for works of service. What do you know? Isn't that just working with and taking care of others? It's no wonder to me then that Jesus refers to himself this way in John 15, 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. And that brings us, I think, right to the heart of the matter. When, when we work to take care of what God has given us, something amazing begins to happen. And that is we begin to bear fruit. And it's not just any fruit. I'm talking about fruit that's manifested in the very tree of life that we read about in Genesis 3 and Revelation 22. Fruit that heals the nations. Fruit that is from the Holy Spirit of God. Notice the word of the Lord once again from Galatians chapter 5. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. This fruit, these attributes, these characteristics. How many of you would describe the place where you work in these terms? Oh, my coworkers are so gentle. They're so kind. They're so patient, so loving. How about when you talk about your spouse? You introduce your spouse to someone. Do you use these terms? Oh, this is my husband. He's so kind. He's so gentle. He has so much self-control. My wife is loving. She's good. She's patient. Do we do that? What about when we talk about our children? Do you see this fruit in yourself when you take a really long, hard look in the mirror? Do you anticipate bearing this fruit as a church in the interim season and beyond? You see, as covenant people of God, we should see the fruit of the Spirit in every aspect of our lives. And if we don't, what that means is we are falling into the exact same trap that Adam and Eve fell into. It means we're getting our nourishment from the wrong place. You want to know what happens when we covenant with death? Paul describes it this way in 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, Boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying its power. Now, I just got to ask, unfortunately, does this sound familiar? I want you to just take a few seconds and process the differences between two lists, what we see in Galatians 5 and what we see in 2 Timothy 3. It's almost shocking, isn't it? It's definitely sobering. In Galatians 5, Paul describes the outcomes of those who work with and take care of what God has given them. Not in the works-based salvation sense, but in the what pleases God sense. In 2 Timothy 3, Paul describes the outcomes of partnering with death. And I want you to notice when we compare the passages side by side in bullet point form, do you notice that the latter is twice as long? It's what we see with the fruit of the Spirit. That's a testimony, I think, of how devastating partnering with death is. And that's why it's critical that as followers of Jesus Christ, we take care of what God 
has given us. Does this fruit of the Spirit not describe the very nature of Jesus himself? And how are these gifts manifested? God sends him to earth, and he makes him a son of Adam. And ultimately, between the two trees, right in the middle of the great end, he allows his son to be raised up on another tree, a tree of death, that becomes a tree of life as we are reconciled back to God's original intention. Paul describes the scope of the distance between the two trees and the turning point that gives us an eternal hope, that gives us purpose. In Romans 6, 23, he says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God, well, that's eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. One more observation from Shane Wood, and then we'll we'll close today. The wages of sin, or the essential end of sin, or the necessary conclusion of sin is indeed death, because sin is union with death. Sin isn't just a debt for which death is the consequence. Sin is willful union with death, ingestion of death, deformation. And thus, Christ's cross can't only be transferring humanity from the status of guilty of a damnable offense to innocent of all charges, sin is uncreation, becoming one flesh with death, which limits our capacity to unite with others, with God, and even with ourselves. Humanity created in the image of God now marred with death's sting. Thus, since the problem of Eden is far more pervasive than first thought, so too must be the solution. And what, or perhaps better asked, who is that solution? And of course, it's Jesus. It's Jesus. Um, Notice what happened. Adam and Eve chose disobedience, and the result was death. Jesus chose obedience, and the result is life. And the results of Jesus' choice Those results are immediate. We are free from our shame, Hebrews 12, 2. We no longer carry the blame, Galatians 3, 24. And church, nothing is the same from the empty tomb all the way through to eternity. And so I challenge you, not just today, but in the interim season and beyond, work to take care of what God has given you. If we commit to that, then the fruit of the Spirit will come. We will all be believers in an entire church, just like the list that you you see on your left here. And I can't think of any better way in this life to be described. And we're going to talk more about that next Sunday when we explore living in the end part two. If you want to talk more, if your life looks more like the list on the right and you are just exhausted from carrying that weight and you know that you're just in this spiral that you it's just leading to death i would love to talk to you this morning about being baptized and having those sins washed away having that burden lifted being made new in christ even before we leave this place this morning and i'm just going to ask you if you're interested in that conversation or have any other need that you want to explore or pray through or process this morning uh, just make a short trip down here to the front row. We'll stand together and we're going to sing. Uh